All right, great. Well, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us for Moving On Mobile, the, the Mobile Marketing Masters series today at AdTech. My name is Rachel Pasqua. I'm the VP of Mobile for iCrossing. We're a global digital marketing agency. Joining me today, I have my old friend Noah Elkin, a principal analyst of eMarketer, and also my co-author on our recently published book, Mobile Marketing, An Hour a Day, from Wally Cybex. We're going to be signing books later on this afternoon up at the, the bookstore. We also have Wendy Berg, mobile and digital vice president um, of Walmart Global E-Commerce. Is that right, Wendy? And Jean Keenan, founder and CEO of The Collective Factory. Um, so we're going to be talking about mobile and paradigm shifts today. Um, so I've been doing this kind of thing, you know, for a fairly long time, you know, speaking at marketing conferences and presenting and that kind of thing. And about four or five years ago, when I really started doing it a lot and doing it in earnest, I started to notice that about a quarter of a way through my presentation, everyone in the audience, or a lot of people in the audience, would be looking down at their devices and texting away. And at first I started to get really deeply insecure about this and thinking, oh, there's something wrong with my presentation, my material's boring, nobody wants to listen to me speak until it finally dawned on me after a little while that most of those people were tweeting my presentation or live blogging it, which of course was great validation and made me feel really good about myself. Um, so I, I think it's an interesting observation to start with because it's, it's one of the best examples that I can think of in all these past years since mobile started to become more and more prominent of how this little screen has, has completely turned everything on its head. Um, smartphones have taken one of the golden rules of human, human interaction and personal communication, which is look at me when I'm talking to you, and turned it completely sideways so that now looking at your device while someone's talking to you is actually, under certain circumstances, kind of a compliment. Um, so multiple screens are really, really changing the way we do pretty much everything. I think you'll all agree. Now, when I first started working for, um, for iCrossing in 2005, which was the dark ages of mobile, as I'm sure everyone here knows, the ecosystem was pretty much this. I mean, obviously, some people were using the web and, you know, and BBMing and, and using, you know, trios and Blackberries. But for the most part, it was really all about the desktop. And our, our big headache was, does it work in Internet Explorer on a Mac? You know, I mean, everyone who was working in digital at that time remembers that big headache. Oh, does it work in Internet Explorer on a Mac? And it seemed like such a big deal. And the fact that we had a couple of browsers to contend with seemed like such a headache, when in reality, we really had it pretty easy compared to now when it's not just about the desktop or smartphones or tablets or phablets, but it's also about digital out of home and theaters and connected TV and social machines and, and Google Glass and all these connected and convergent um, objects and locations and devices that are filling up what Forrester has deemed the splinternet. So I think everyone knows it's a global phenomenon. It took 20 years for the first billion phones to sell, the second billion sold in four years, the third billion sold in two. This is, this is the true groundswell that we're looking at. By 2014, according to Mary Meeker, and she hasn't been wrong so far, the majority of custom consumers worldwide, the majority of your customers will be accessing the web and interacting with brands and with one another via some kind of mobile device. So just to set the stage for you a little bit, and my, my co-panelists will dive sort of deeper into what this all means to you. Um, and a lot of this you might already be aware of, many of you. 246.5 million Americans, 77% of our population own mobile phones, 44.3% 40, of the population own smartphones, 38.9% of the population own tablets. Now the growth of tablets just in the past year alone has been tremendous. And just from personal observation, and I would imagine a lot of people here in the audience had the same experience. You know, in my, in my family, I'm, I'm you know, my husband and I are kind of like the, the, the geeks and the tech support for the rest of the family who don't do what we do for a living. Now, everyone has heard that this past Christmas, this unboxing day, was the, the biggest activation of smartphones and tablets in history. And I know for a fact that's true because I played tech support all week for relatives who, you know, up until now barely used the web, who'd bought themselves a new iPad, a Kindle, an Android smartphone, who are really trying to figure out how to use these devices. There's a huge influx of people who, up, up until now, were, were really sort of marginal, even web users, who are glomming onto mobile in, in an astonishing way. This is going to be a really incredible year for people who were really on the fringe of, of the web in general to become real power users via mobile devices. And I know I've seen it firsthand, and I'm sure many of you have as well. So smartphone ownership. We're now at 140 million people. Nearly half of all Americans own smartphones. Nearly a third of all Americans own a tablet or e-reader. 
So globally, mobile represents 13% of all internet traffic. Now, I, I've heard this statistic a lot, and like any statistics, you really have to take with a grain of salt. You know, they come from different places. This one came from Stat Counter. I know from personal observation, again, that the, out of all of the brands that I work with, which ranges from you know, small mom and pop brands to major automotive brands and travel and hospitality brands, the majority of them now see about 20% of their overall digital traffic coming from mobile devices. Now that's smartphones and tablets combined. Some of them are seeing close to 30. At a bare, bare minimum, there's a handful seeing 15. So again, this year, and that was a jump from about 10% as, as a sort of mean last year. So yeah, 13%, it, it, mobile represents 13% of all internet traffic sort of on a, a global standard, but I would argue that it's, it's closer to 20, and by the end of this year, it's probably gonna be closer to 30 or 40. So I think we all know, um, courtesy of Google's recent multi-use um, multi device study, that m using multiple devices throughout the day is now the status quo. At certain points in the day, we're more, um, we're more married to one vi device than the other. Obviously, we're, you know, we're more engaged with our desktops during the day at work, the tablets and the smartphones on the evening, but the, you know, even though that we're, when we're away from the desktop, these smaller screens are almost never out of hand. They're always close by, especially the smartphone. So it's a multi-device, multi-screen world now. So I think important things to think about, you know, very, very basic themes. For tomorrow's consumers, mobile, mobile is the web. I'm the mother of four and a half year old twins. My kids had their first digital interactive experience using a tablet. They've learned their, their one, two, threes, and their ABCs on tablets. For them, it's a multi-touch world. They go up to my, my big screen Mac on my desk at home and get very frustrated when they can't you know, toggle through things by hand. Um, to them, this is the web. For global consumers, obviously, it's their main conduit to news and commerce and brands and one another. On a global basis, there are a lot of people who will just skip right over the desktop web and probably never have a desktop web experience. For them, it's all about smartphones and probably increasingly all about tablets. And for older generations, going back to uh, Unboxing Day this past Christmas, I had a lot of relatives over the age of 65 who went out and bought themselves an iPad, bought themselves a Kindle. My 73-year-old mother, who I've been trying to buy an iPad for about four years, three, four years now, went out and bought herself a Nook on a whim. For older people, this is becoming a more, um, a, a more realistic and more you know, usable, useful experience. And a lot of them are, are, again, leapfrogging the desktop web and going right to tablet and right to smartphone. Although I would argue with more older people, more tablet. So bottom line is mobile's changing the way we, we interact with brands, with one another, the way we find places, people, things, the way we shop, the way we learn, the way we work. And it's transforming the way we do business. And I think one last personal observation, and then I'll just, I'll, I'll go through a few more slides and go to my, my co-panelists, but every year my husband and I take our kids to a little farm on the north shore of Long Island where we live to, um, to pick pumpkins for, for Halloween, right before Halloween. And it's one of those mom and pop farmer green jeans kinds of farms, you know, where it's the grandparents and the parents and the grandkids, you know, and there's a million ways to spend money. You can have a hayride or a pony ride. You can buy pumpkins and cider donuts. And the past years going up to this year, they were making change out of cigar boxes. And this year when we went back, at every single stand, they had iPads and square readers. So I think it's interesting to understand, to look at how mobile devices are, are, are vitalizing and revitalizing business. Interestingly enough, I think, starting with the mom and pop businesses and then ground swelling up, as opposed to starting with the bigger businesses and, and trickling down. So it's a really, really fantastically interesting wave of change, and we know from experience across industries, across verticals, that a unified four-screen strategy and activation plan have a really significant impact on the funnel. Your audience can increase by 135%. Consumer drop-off can improve by 20 Overall conversions can increase by 19%, yet while the investment continues to grow, there's this big gap between consumption and mobile ad spend. You know, we're spending upwards of 10% of our time, 13% of our time um, in digital channels engaged via mobile devices, yet less than 1% of the spend is going to mobile. So obviously, you know, you have to wonder why that is. And so in preparing for this panel, we really talked about, you know, what is it we're missing? What's, why are we missing the mark as marketers? Because we know we can reach new audiences and create a closer connection. We know this is a fundamental wave of change for, for you know, uh, present generations, for older generations, for upcoming generations. We know we can drive sales online and in store and that we can enhance brand awareness and consumer advocacy. We know what a powerful channel this is. So how do we close that gap between this very, very obvious opportunity and spend? So today we're going to discuss how, how we, can, we can close that gap by looking at it through three very specific lenses that are of importance to 
pretty much any brand. There's marketing. So how do mobile consumers shop and how you can you capture their intention, whether it's online or, or in a physical real world setting? Then merchandising, you know, if marketing is about getting them into your store, virtual or otherwise, merchandising is about getting them to the register again, you know, virtually or otherwise. And then CRM, which I think is where it really gets super, super interesting. How do you connect, how do you get people to, to stay connected with you via a mobile channel and how do you get them to sort of share that love? So that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, we'll start with, uh, with Noah talking about marketing. So I want to pick up a little bit where uh, where Rachel left off, and you know, thinking about how we uh, really how we use our how our how our audiences are using mobile devices today, and where you can actually reach them in this in this multi-screen, multi multi-tasking world. You know, if you think about what we use mobile devices for today, and Rachel sort of alluded to this, is that we we rely on them to get for 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 finding things, right? For very very literally in a, in a in a navigational sense for getting where we need to go, but also sort of people finding and stuff finding. So where we're going and getting what we want where we're going, and you can sort of see that the unique qualities of mobile and the the fact that they are location enabled. So things like time and place become increasingly important. Uh, targeting factors when we're trying to reach this uh, increasingly mobilized audience. And social, of course, remains a key pillar of this as well, right? So uh, by, by eMarketer's uh, latest forecast, uh, almost two-thirds of, of mobile users will, will uh, access social networks on their devices this year. So, and if you think about some of the some of the moves we've seen in the industry over the past couple of months, Facebook, the introduction of Facebook Home just last week, the introduction of graph search, the the social experience is going to be increasingly front and center on uh, on our mobile screens, and whether or not the uh, whether or not the the solutions that you see in the market today are something that appeal to you from a consumer uh, consumer perspective, more and more you're going to see that effort to put that social social experience uh, at, at the very forefront of 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 our mobile uh, of our of, of our mobile devices and our, and and our and our mobile experience. And increasingly, uh, you know, we, we've seen in the marketing, as Rachel showed in the, in terms of the the uh, the the advertising gap and the marketing gap here. There's a, a significant opportunity on the commerce side as well. So mobile has, has remained this has remained this sideshow, uh, not only in, in in advertising but also in commerce for a long time. But up until now, up until now, but it's increasingly impossible to ignore. And I think uh, Wendy and Jean will talk about this a, a little bit more from a. Uh, as we get farther farther down the funnel, but it 's increasingly important in terms of how we use our devices uh, the the actual the actual purchases that 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 consumers may make on their devices may take place more at home uh, predominantly at home at this point, especially uh, when when we 're talking about tablets but the ability uh, the ability for for all of us as marketers to influence those purchases those moments of truth where 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 your where, where your audience makes a choice between your product or or your competitor all of those decisions can take place virtually anywhere and, and, and everywhere. So increasingly, as marketers, we have the need, all of us, to influence that, influence those decisions. And that really is something that is not bound by the, not, not as much bound by place and time as it, as it, as it once was. And, you know, from, from our perspective, it, it, we, we see, we see re, an increasing portion of retail e-commerce uh, migrating to to mobile devices, and I think interestingly here you see this shift, this this split taking place within mobile between the smartphone path, where you have uh, you, you have uh, purchasers uh, uh, making certain kinds of uh, consumers making certain kinds of purchases, and then tablets, which are really increasingly competing for lap space at, at home with uh, with uh, with PCs, and an increasing portion of the of this of this. Uh, of this e retail e-commerce that's shifting to, to to mobile is actually going to is actually going to take place on uh, on, on tablet computers, 
And we think about it, you know, there's a lot of sort of fun and games associated with mobile, but it's not, it's, it's not all fun and games. And we think about uh, the way that mobile is also transforming business. If we think about this emerging class of, 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 smart, of the smart device, uh, of smart device owners where uh, their, their, their devices are their, their entertainment center, uh, their social communi their communication hub. It's also their workplace. So again, we sort of see, and, and Rachel alluded to this, where you have this groundswell coming from small businesses who are adopting these solutions that enable them to, uh, enable them to reach an audience and, and, and essentially mobilize their business in a very, uh, in a very palpable, very rapid, very rapid way. And what all of this boils down to, and uh, now we, uh, in any e-marketer presentation, we have to have some data and some charts, so we get into the, the chart portion here. And all of this sort of speaks to this growing amount of time that consumers, uh, consumers are spending with mobile. Right? Today, uh, consumers spend twice as much time with a desktop, three times as much time with, uh, with TV as they do with mobile. But the interesting thing is how, how much faster the, the time we spend with mobile is growing. 14 times the rate of, of the desktop. So if we think about that trajectory and assuming that we continue on that trajectory uh, over the next couple of years, mobile and desktop are, gonna, are, are really going to equalize in terms of the, the amount of time that, 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 our, that our audiences spend with it. And that has huge implications for how we market, uh, uh, how we market to them. And I think in this you can you can say goodbye. We think of the the this, the age of, of consumers passively uh, passively uh, c consuming uh, TV content and and the associated ads. We can say goodbye to that age, right? It's especially true. You see this sort of very freakishly posed millennials here, um, but and uh, obviously something very compelling on that TV screen. But increasingly, the, the audience that you see is going to be like this, where regardless of demographic, the screen in front of them uh, is more likely to be a smartphone or a tablet. And it kind of begs the question in, in that environment, you know, with the TV in the background, which is, which is the first screen? Is it, is it that larger screen that, that's, that's sitting on the table or on the wall, or is it the screen that's more directly, uh, more directly in front of them and the one that's really engaging them and, and gaining their attention to a, to a greater and greater degree? And you know, within this, you, you say hello to this multi-screen, multi-platform consumer where TV, yes, is still important in terms of the, in terms of the upper funnel, uh, sort of upper, upper funnel activities in terms of generating awareness and driving con some consideration of, of, uh, of, of purchase decisions, but where TV is, 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 is no longer the, the only screen involved, and it's really much more uh, where smart devices are the link between the, the traditional media that, that we use and really uh, in, in terms of all of, the, all of the activities that are important to us on a, on a daily basis, whether it's media consumption right down, uh, right down, to, uh, right down to commerce. And you know, you, as, as you start to see this, you start to see this development of, of this audience as these processes spread where things that used to be much more linear, if we think about it, a, a linear path to purchase, we've now, we now have activities that take place in a much more circuitous fashion uh, or, a much, or, or even, on, even on parallel paths if we think about how consumers shop, uh, how consumers shop today. So again, we have the, a, a much greater complexity in this, in this you know, what's often been termed this omni-channel environment where you don't know, you, you can't guarantee a, a consistent uh, on-ramp into, into the purchase process. And so as a marketer, you're more challenged than ever to cover your bases across all of these different screens so that you can influence and get people uh, on, on whatever screen they are at whatever time of, uh, whatever time of day they're, they're using it. And I think that sort of brings us to the next point. If you, it's really thinking about what are the activities that people are looking at across those uh, across those screens. What is and, and how do those correspond to to the day uh, to day part? And I think you see the interesting thing in the data you see on this slide. There's a lot of con there's a lot of convergence here in terms of the the peak hours. But you know you, you look at things like browsing, voice uh, messaging, social network use, um, and then you sort of look at the the, the off hours where some of these other activities uh, are, are taken. Taking place, and and the implications in terms of how you reach your audiences or the micro audiences that you find uh, within these different activities. 
And then similarly, if you think about a lot of this being, uh, a, a lot of this activity being uh, very much ad-driven, and looking at, looking at the relationship here as on the desktop uh, in a mobile context where, where, where display and, and search activity uh, are, uh, uh, do, have that, do have that correlation. And again, you start to see a dis an, an emergence here of different, uh, a different behavior patterns, very distinct behavior patterns between smartphone owners uh, and, and tablet owners. And I think that, that's something that is very important to keep an eye on because as we see more tablets come into the market, as we see tablets substituting, uh, the, substituting PCs to a much greater extent, we're going to see that split, I think, widen, uh, widen even more. And, you know, again, also part of this is, is paying attention to location, right? So we have time and we have location and channel and intent, right? So we think about uh, a, a, lot of this, a lot of this activity that's taking place, a lot of the search activity that's taking place on our, on our smart devices. Uh, the majority of it is taking place at home. Uh, and, and, and a lot of it is, is, not, is, is being used to satisfy a, a future need, not necessarily, or qualify a future purchase, not necessarily satisfy, uh, satisfy an, an immediate need. And, in, and thinking also about where, where, are these, where are these people, where is this activity taking place, majority of it's still taking place uh, through the browser, and that's especially true uh, when, when you look at, look at a tablet scenario as well. And, you know, part of that is then how do you how do you reach that audience, right? How do you how do you take advantage of the innate uh, qualities of mobile? And one of those are the, the the location targeting and the ability to personalize personalize ads in uh, according to all of these all of these different contexts that uh, that that in which you find uh, in which you find your your mobile users. And of course, as we get farther down the purchase funnel, as you get uh, as you get closer to the store, you, you see here that uh, consumers are much more, uh, much more attuned to the ads that you might be sending them, much more attuned to the offers you might be presenting them, because they are in that purchase mode. So for consumers who are in that mode of trying to satisfy an immediate need, all of those things are, are going to be uh, much, more, um, much more present for them uh, in, in those situations. And you know, we heard a lot about showrooming in the past year. I'm sure Wendy will, will, will talk, and Gene will talk about that a little bit more, but this idea of consumers who are in the store comparing prices, consulting reviews, um, you know, that gained a ton of momentum in, in 2012. And I, don't think, I think we can expect that, that, uh, that, that that's going to continue and become an, an increasingly more present part of, uh, of, 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 the, of the shopping landscape. But you know, the Pew studies and others uh, have shown that, that marketers stand a good chance of, of keeping those purchases uh, in store. You know, this Pew stat here, 46 of showroomers actually buy, buy where they search. So again, there was an interesting IBM study that came out uh, about a month ago, and it sort of looked. What's up? Fifty percent lead loss is not that great. But it could be worse. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think the, the point is there is that there, there is, there's, there's a sense of urgency that is not necessarily uh, backed up by the, the data that shows the, how consumers actually buy in those scenarios. So I'm not disagreeing with this at all. I'm just saying it's, it could be worse, and it could get worse when Amazon and others start doing same-day delivery. Just that part of it is, part of it, I think, is you want that instant gratification of, like, oh, it might cost me $5 more. Like, more Right, so I mean, it's definitely we're at a crucial, a crucial juncture for the retailers to uh, make sure that they, they implement ways to, in, to and strategies to keep that, keep those purchases in the store. Absolutely. Um, Didn't mean to realize. No, it's okay. it's a good discussion. Uh, so one of the things that Rachel and I talk a lot about in in, in the book, and just give a, a couple of examples here, and then pass the pass the mic over to to Wendy, is that we think about the the smart mobile strategy uses the technology technology that 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 is accessible to the widest audience to, to really not only improve your your uh, your return as as a marketer, but also to improve the experience uh, on on the customer side. And we, we in our book we talk a lot about uh, we, we talk uh, about Coca Cola as this brand that uses mobile extensively around the world as 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 they say to as an enabler of desire. 
Um, and if you think about Coca-Cola, you know, one of the world's biggest brands, tremendous marketing resources, they spend heavily in, in it, all across the world, and you would think of them as being a cutting edge, uh, a, a cutting edge mobile marketer. And to a certain extent, they are. They, stu they do spend a, a portion of their of their marketing budget. Uh, on cutting edge exper mobile experiments, but they also make use of, uh, of much more accessible, much more universal uh, tactics like SMS, which you know we, we don't think of we don't think of often, especially in sort of in a, in a conference here where, where we're focused on the next wave of technology. But when you think in this global context and thinking of the audience that Rachel uh, that Rachel talked about, how do you reach that that maximum audience so that you can actually enable uh, enable that desire to the to the largest possible uh, largest possible portion of it? So it's again thinking about who that. Who you're trying to reach, and, to, and and what are the technologies that are going to enable you to to, to do that uh, in in the in the greatest possible sense, and sort of the other end of the sale, you have a you know, brand like Walgreens that uh, is not so much talking about enabling desire, but really about solving uh, solving consumer pain points in a, in a very literal way. Um, as 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 a as a pharmacy as a pharmacy brand that uses uh, a full range of of, of 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 technologies from SMS to apps that allow you to refill prescriptions or get your photos printed, um, really where you have the brand as kind of your your personal personal digital assistant. And the last thing, you know, to sort of end on this note, where you think about this this idea of mobile, we, there's it's been talked about for a very long time as mobile as as this as this uh, a technology that that allows you to bridge the physical and digital worlds, and, and that remains uh, it remains truer than ever. And you think about an example like this. Uh, uh, many of you have probably seen the, probably seen this photo, but of, of a Tesco supermarket in, in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, this ad that that, that took over the subway station, and it allows people to scan QR codes and actually do their grocery shopping as they're waiting for their subway train. So you have this this way in which, in this sort of maximal sort of maximalist case, where uh, you actually mobile enables the, uh, this this digital response, this dig this direct response mechanism uh, that activates the static media and actually does something that we 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 always try to achieve, which is to make advertising useful. And I think this is uh, an example where you can actually do help e-commerce, e the, the E in e-commerce, actually move from being electronic to, to, to really to everywhere. So thank you very much. And we'll give the floor to Wendy. Hi. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm going to talk to you about Walmart and merchandising and mobile. Let me just pull up uh, my presentation here. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So a key piece of Walmart strategy is delivering anytime, anywhere access to our customers. Customers don't come to Walmart stores and they don't, and they, they don't tell their friends, hey, I shopped at Walmart store today or I shopped at walmart.com today. They talk about shopping with Walmart. And so when we serve them through the different channels, we need to make sure they're getting a holistic experience. And mobile plays a really big piece in that, in making sure that we tie those different channels together into one holistic experience for the customers. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, and, and how we deliver those great customer experiences. The first, there, there's, kind of, there's three pieces of it. The first one is what we call mobilizing.com. And that's really just giving customers the ability to shop our .com experiences through smartphones and tablets. This is a necessary part of anyone's um, retail strategy. It, 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 in a lot of ways, it's, it's really the, the table stakes. Customers expect it nowadays, and if you don't have it, you're, you're not serving them um, well. A differentiating part of our strategy because of the 4,000 stores we have across the U.S. is what we call mobilizing stores, and that's really about creating indispensable tools for our store customers, giving them the ability to help themselves, giving them uh, tools that help them save more money, more time in the store, make it a more convenient experience. And when you tie mobilizing.com and mobilizing stores together, you naturally accelerate multi-channel, that seamless experience for customers. We do this across platforms. Um, today we have uh, apps on Android, iPad, and iPhone. 
We have an M website and we do some S SMS work as well. Uh, our team, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, we serve multiple banners for Walmart. So we're creating a lot of leverage in what we do. Um, you know, things like barcode scanning, shopping lists are things that customers use uh, not only in the US but also in the UK and Canada and so forth. As we think about where we're focusing of those three strategies, the biggest piece or the biggest focus for us is really around mobilizing stores. It's a huge opportunity. Deloitte actually gave some numbers uh, last year looking at how, where this opportunity was and where it's going. And so in 2012, 5% of in-store retail was influenced by mobile. That's about $158 billion. By 2016, it gets to 20% or as high as you know, almost $700 billion. It's a huge opportunity. And you know, for Walmart, we have um, over 140 million people that walk into our stores every week in the US, 200 million globally. And so for us, we want to make sure those customers have a great experience. And so we're really focused on using mobile as a way to enhance that experience in the stores. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing on that front. So we've really looked at how a customer shops with us, from the pre-planning to in-store decision-making to check out uh, pieces of their shopping trip. And when we thought about the planning process, a lot of customers create shopping lists. In fact, we know 90% of customers create a shopping list before they get to the store. So there's this huge opportunity for us to make that a more seamless, easier digital experience for them. So we created mobile shopping lists. Customers can add items to their list. They can see the local store price. They can see the quantity. Um, and we've also uh, show customers aisle location um, as well. And so it helps them manage their budget before they get to the store and have a good idea of where they're going to need to go within the store. Once they get to the store, we've, we've launched something what we call store mode. And basically what happens is we've geofenced the 4,000 stores across the US. So when a customer walks into our store and has the Walmart app open, uh, we will ask them if they want to enter store mode. And store mode is basically a rich set of tools that allow the customer to have a better experience in stores. As you can see in the middle here, it, store mode consists of a local ad. So we have interactive local ad where a customer can find out what's on special that week. Um, they can see what's new in store. They can access um, a barcode scanner and a QR code scanner to do price checking and, and get more information about products. They can see local rollbacks. They can also get to their shopping list. And then one of the newest things if you're in, um, that we're testing is on the checkout front. And then if you're in one of the 200 stores, 200 plus stores that we've launched this in, you'll also be able to see Scan and Go. And Scan and Go, like I said, is a, is a test we're running in about 200 stores across 14 regions. And Scan and Go basically allows the customer to come into our stores, scan items while they shop, and when they're done, they can transfer their basket from the phone to the self-checkout register and pay as they normally would. So the idea is the customer gets more control of their shopping experience. Again, they can manage their budget before they get to the checkout line, um, and they don't have to scan once they're up there. They, they've already done that while they're shopping. Uh, like I said, we're testing it right now. We've gotten some good, um, we're getting some good customer feedback. One of the things we've seen is 50% of customers who have used it, over 50% of customers who have used it have come back and used it again. Um, and so as we continue to learn from customers, we'll, we'll expand upon this program. And, and um, the other th cool thing about Scan and Go is every customer that does Scan and Go gets an e-receipt in a, in a locker. And so uh, they'll be able to see, um, uh, a digital version of their physical receipt and have access to that. So, you know, one of the things, there's a couple ways we gauge, you know, are we doing a good job of delivering great customer experiences? Um, one of them is the App Store ratings. Um, all of our apps right now, both in Walmart and in Asda, as is our UK banner, um, have four and a half star ratings. When we started uh, mobile, when we really started to dive into mobile about two years ago, our apps, we didn't have an ad, any Asda apps, and in Walmart they were like at three stars. And we, we realized that wasn't acceptable. We said we really have to be above four stars. We have to be meeting customers' expectations. So we did a lot of looking at what are our customers saying? What don't they like about the app? 
experiences, and they wanted them to be faster. They wanted to have those store experiences. They wanted to have more access to the brands they love, to the to the to understand what's going on at their local store. And so we really did um, start to focus on mobilizing stores, making better experiences. We replatformed all of our experiences, and now they're all at four and a half stars. And that's been um, a huge focus for us, and something we watch on a regular basis. The other thing that um, you know, it's been great as we've recently been recognized by a variety of different industry uh, industry um, associations, whether it's Mobile Commerce Daily, uh, the Mobile Excellence Awards in the U.S. or overseas, um, Mumsnet, which is uh, basically the largest social um, uh, social group uh, in in the U.K. Uh, they talk a lot about like what moms like, what parents like to do, and that group voted us um, as, as a Mums Net Best Award, which was great because those are the customers that shop at as on a daily basis. So what does it take to bring this to life? Because a lot of people ask me, you know, how is Walmart doing this? Is it just the mobile team? Um, what makes this happen? And I'll tell you that a huge part of um, us being able to deliver these great experiences to customers has been uh, making sure different teams across the organization are aligned on goals um, and strategy. And so, you know, the, the mobile team plays a huge part in that, in that we decided, um, because delivering that seamless anytime, anywhere access to our customers was a key piece of our strategy, that we would invest in a, in a you know, great mobile product and engineering talent in-house. So we've done that, um, and we have, uh, we've built that talent in-house. We didn't want to outsource it because we felt like it was important to us to have that in-house. But our team also works really closely with, with the teams that drive the store systems. Um, for example, the point of sale systems. Or the online services that drive the, the walmart.com site. Um, store operations. So, for example, when we launched Scan and Go, there's obviously a huge amount of training for associates around that. And then marketing, making sure our customers understand these new tools that we, we can offer them and, and know how to get access to them. So, it, in a lot of ways, it's a whole company fight when you're trying to deliver that seamless access. And so, you know, one of the things I often tell people is don't think one team can do this alone. It really is making sure you have that alignment across the organization. And lastly, um, you know, a lot of people say, okay, well, what, what is your plan? How do you think about it? We're really just passionate about creating products that people love. We believe if we create products people, that people love, they'll use them, and that will, um, that will allow us to lead in retail, um, particularly on the store side. That's very important to us. Like I said, we have in the U.S. alone 140 million people that come into our stores every week. It's really important that we deliver great experience to them, and we want to create leverage in all of that. Um, and so a lot of what we're doing in the development of these products is, is thinking about leverage so that we can, um, as we go to more banners around the world, uh, uh, not start from scratch. Um, and then, you know, it wouldn't be fair for me to end without a Sam Walton quote. He was huge in creating the culture for Walmart. Um, it's an amazing company, and, you know, today the culture is so, still so strong. And one of the things he said, um, you know, this is probably 20 or 30 years ago, but it still holds uh, true today, is I have always been driven to buck the system, to innovate, to take things beyond where they've been. And mobile is an example of how we're doing that today for Walmart. Um, and, you know, we have the, the kind of silly little visual here, but it's the Spark plus mobile equals, hopefully, you know, the, the idea here is that customers will love and, and have more loyalty to Walmart over time because of these great experiences we're delivering them. And that's, that's the end of mine, so I will pass it on over. Sorry, I haven't used PowerPoint in, or PC in like five years. It, it took me a minute too. And slideshow. Okay, awesome. Uh, hello, everybody. So my name is Gene Keenan. I'm founder of The Collective Factory. It's a mobile consultancy. We work with a bunch of different companies. Right now we're finished. We're actually, we're not finishing. We're project working for four seasons, and it's a project that continues to grow. And I'm going to uh, actually reiterate a lot of things that have already been said by Wendy and Noah and 
uh, Rachel. I'm going to kind of summarize it here at the beginning, but I'm going to talk about how CRM changes everything in just 10 minutes. And CRM is a very enormous topic, so I, I really can't actually cover it all in 10 minutes, but I'll cover the basics. So the roots of CRM change. Uh, I think that it's been said, the internet is now everywhere. We need to stop calling it the mobile web or something different. It's actually just the internet. And the fact that it's on a phone means that it is now everywhere. And now that the, inner part, now that the internet is part of everything, it means that it affects uh, internal enterprise organizations. And Wendy was just talking about this, how it was like a whole company fight to do mobile, and that's really the only way it's ever going to work if you want to do successful CRM or successful mobile. It's enterprise external, it's the consumer, and it's external systems. How many of you work at uh, companies that have horrible desktop-bound applications like timesheets or reporting? Raise your hand. I know that everybody's out there. Why can't you use, why can't you be doing that on the road? Why can't you be on a bus, on a train, a plane, doing these mundane tasks that you are tied to a desktop to do. And I gotta tell you, millennials, this pisses them off to no end that they have to sit there and do this because they're the first generation that was born with a digital chip in their brain. And they don't understand why this stuff is like tied or tethered. So the, the implication here is that information just is bits free of space and time that changes based on user needs. And this is the key to CRM and Wendy, I think, did a great job talking about that to the in-store mode for what they have for mobile. Um, what this means is everything becomes CRM. And what I really mean when I say CRM, I'm saying you can't really make it in marketing unless, unless you have mobile. And that is the new meaning for CRM. And impl implementation implications for you guys. Stop thinking in silos, people. I mean, seriously. Talk, I mean, again, Wendy's example, impossible to do unless they were working together as a team. Why do we think in silos? Because all of our data sits in islands. You think about the roots of the internet, the internet came along and there was an IT staff that said that like, oh, we can't deal with that. So the marketing team said like, fine, we're gonna create this new email database. Or we're gonna create a direct mail database. Or we're gonna create like a website. It's not gonna be tie tied to email and direct mail and in-store sales. I mean, it's amazing how many retail websites you go to, you can't check inventory for a store uh, at a specific location. Location, it actually blows my mind. It's like, come on people, get your stuff together. Stop thinking in silos and, stop, and pull your data out of islands. And, you, with that, and, and ultimately what this means is you need to rethink all your constant content strategy and experiences to address your user's current need state. Not the marketer's need state, the user's need state. Here's an example from the iPhone, born in 2007, June 2007. Look at this. Devices now conform to the needs of users. How come your communications don't? You guys all have all had an iPhone or some sort of phone that where you just flip the access and you suddenly it goes from a 10 key calculator to a scientific calculator. How come your marketing can't flip and do the same thing? Why are you tying it to uh, discrete personas and discrete experiences that don't evolve. So what this means is you need to onboard or fire your IT staff. I'm kind of joking, but not really. I mean, think about like, again, Walmart. The reason they were successful is because they had everybody on board. And if you don't have everybody on board, start firing those people who push back on you. And I'm totally serious about this because mobile will never work unless you have everybody in the company on board with this initiative. You're laughing, but I'm totally serious. I mean, I'm kind of joking, but I'm serious. In fact, uh, Deloitte actually has done a number of studies that show that like 50% of all marketers or all IT, 50% of marketers think all IT staff is against them and that they cannot implement the programs they want to implement because IT continually pushes back. I'm not trying to demonize IT. There's lots of, lots of organizations within the company, within any company, that are gonna push back on any kind of initiative. And it's because, why? We think in silos because we put ourselves in silos, and part of it is we just don't wanna leave our comfort zone. And if you wanna do successful CRM, again, it's gotta be a whole team effort. So the simple path to understanding this is that 
This is every person in the universe. When you think about it, this has already been touched, about, uh, touched on by all these guys here, so I'm not going to go through this in painful detail. But you think about it, time and space, what is that user's thinking? It's intent based upon their location, uh, in, whether it's uh, at their home, whether it's in store, uh, information you have about your users. So for instance, um, it could be your CR, it could be like your database about like the tar like Target, for instance. Target knows every single product that every customer has ever purchased. That's why they can use they can use that big data to create better CRM experiences for their customers. And then um, there's you know there's the, what the phone knows, which I already talked about, and then there's the current psychological state, which is a really hard thing to address, but it's it's possible if you have lots of money, but I'm sure most of you don't like me. Uh, so what's the case for this? The case is this. This is the travel life cycle from uh, years before. Basically, it was a sell, a pre-arrival, and a post-departure experience. And that was it. That was the customer relation management for, for everything. And now, this is the new CR, this is the new life cycle. You can make this larger, but I identified nine stages of travel. Shop and consider, book reserve, plan and prepare, transit and route, welcome, stay and enjoy, departure, relive and share, dream to do that trip again, right? And how does this work from a CRM perspective? Well, it's very complex, but I'm gonna show you some really simple examples. So I'm gonna show you transit and route, best served by the connected device, by connected devices, because nobody's gonna pull out their laptop and start surfing the web uh, when they're at a bus stop or uh, in a cab. Make the user's travel experience less stressful. That's the goal because uh, this is for Four Seasons. Four Seasons is a, very, is a luxury brand, and the goal of the Four Seasons is to provide the ultimate service possible. When I'm talking about the ultimate service, I'm talking about like, when you, how many of you go to a, a great restaurant, and what do you typify by great service? Service you don't notice. It's things that you get when you want them without asking for them, and this is the goal of Four Seasons in their mobile. So here's a couple examples. I'm transited, I'm en route, need something upon our arrival, call concierge, uh, travel time from your present location to SeaTac is 35 minutes. This person is coming to San Francisco. Again, no brainer, simple thing to do. Uh, stay and enjoy. What's the goal here for Four Seasons? Extend the experience off, off and on the property where the user is forced, uh, where they're providing a high impact, low touch experience. That's the goal is like, um, again, like that restaurant experience, people who stay in luxury hotels like Four Seasons, they don't wanna really be talking to a lot of people. They just wanna get what they want when they want it without having to ask for it. And that is the goal of uh, great service. So here's another example. Four Seasons, your massage appointments at 9 a.m. is available. Um, your driver, your dinner reservation for RN74 is ready for this evening at, at 7.30. And I can go on and on, but um, like from an application perspective, the application changes and evolves based upon the location. It's not just like for in-store mode, it's like I'm at the airport mode. It's I'm at, the air, uh, I'm at the hotel mode. Again, because why are we creating things that don't change the needs of the user? That's dumb. And that's what mobile's all about. Like why, do you, why, why, do you, why does everybody have so many apps on their phone? You have so many apps on your phone because these apps all do like one thing instead of like, evolving to do the thing that you want them to do, right? Is that, you guys agree with that? Like, how many apps do you have on your phone, 40 or 50? It's crazy. All right, I think that's it. I went a little bit over. Um, I think we're gonna do Q&A now, after my fire and brimstone speech on CRM. Thank you. Thank you.